In this video, I'm going to go over some advanced applications of position. So we're going to cover things like applying position to threads, patterns, applying position without any datum references. There is one exception where you can do that. And then things like conical tolerance zones and repetitive patterns of features with repeated datum reference frames. Some of this you may never see your entire career. It's good to know, especially if you want to take the senior certification exam, because these are the kinds of questions they try to you know, get you with. In the ASME standard, there's no relation between how often something is used and how important it is and how much is written about it. So there could be something super important that only has like one paragraph or something that's barely ever used that has like two pages devoted to it. So I'm going to try to treat all of these topics equally, even though you might not use them or see them very often. Now first, let's get into applying position to threads. So position can be applied directly to threads to control the location of the feature. Now, it's important that ASME standard recognizes the uh, feature related to threads as the pitch cylinder of the threads. That is what you're controlling with this position tolerance, not the major diameter or the minor diameter by default. Now what that means, inspection-wise, is you need some somewhat special equipment. Now there's, you know, special thread gauges made for this, but you have to try to find the pitch cylinder, so kind of the middle between the tops and the bottoms of the threads. And this makes sense because that's what locates threads. You could have a thread like this. Our pitch cylinder is determined off the, you know, pitch of the threads. If somebody came in and they ground the tops of the threads like so, right, you take some off the top of this side and some off the top of this side, you'd get a different answer if you gauge this thread by, you know, putting it in a collet or a chuck, it'd tend to tilt a little bit, right? So the major diameter doesn't always locate threads very well but it's much easier to inspect, right? It, to grab, to find what the, the axis of this feature is. If you're looking at the major diameter, you just clamp it in a chalk or a V-block or something. But if you need to find out what the pitch cylinder is, you need a special thread that closes down on the feature to locate this pitch diameter, which is what locates the actual axis of the thread. Now, that being said, as a default requirement, you have to get the pitch cylinder to find out if this thread is in within its position tolerance. But you can very easily, underneath the feature control frame, indicate that this should be inspected at the major diameter. The thread might not locate as well, but it's much easier for inspection to do it. Now that's a conversation you have to have between design and inspection about you know what kind of requirements you're looking for, but that does make inspection easier. We can do the exact same thing for a threaded hole. Now some people might say you can inspect this with the largest pen gauge that will fit through it just like you're inspecting a regular hole, but since you're really looking for the pitch diameter, the largest pen gauge is not a representation of the actual mating envelope of that thread. You're looking for the pitch cylinder. You can remedy this in the design room by just indicating minor diameter beneath the feature control frame. Now there's an argument that this should be the default requirement and then that you should have to go through extra effort in the design room to call out the pitch cylinder. But the ASME standard typically defaults to you know, the least fun option or the safest option. It, it's kind of like you know, how things default to regardless of feature size, which is more difficult to inspect, but you know, it's typically you know, gives you the tighter tolerances. Okay? The next thing is there's an argument here as to whether you should apply MMC to threads. I would say normally you shouldn't because if the thread comes in small and you want to take advantage of that MMC, 
one, there's not that much difference between the largest a thread can come in and the smallest it can come in, maybe you know, thousands or two, you know, depending on the, the size of the thread. And it's more difficult to find that out than it is to you know, inspect a thread at RFS. Uh, I think it's fairly common to always call threads out at regardless of feature size. If your company uses MMC on threads and you inspect that way, I'd be glad to know in the comments. Please uh, let me know down below. So next I want to move to counterbores. Now normally a counterbore is called out with a single position tolerance that applies to the hole and the counterbore. Let me show you what I mean. So the most common way a counterbore is put on a drawing is like so. We've got the diameter of the through hole, which always comes first. We've got the counterbore symbol and then the diameter of the counterbore followed by a depth either below it or beside it. And then we've got a feature control frame that indicates both of these are going to be to whatever the datum reference frame is, I've omitted it in this figure, to uh, 14 thousandths. So the same tolerance zone for both of them from the same datum reference frame. Essentially the axis of both features must fall within that tolerance zone. Okay. Now this can be fine but it typically is more expensive. You know you, typically you want uh, a kind of small hole because you need bearing surface for you know the underside of a bolt head but often the counterbore could get larger like that wouldn't affect the design you know unless it's running up into a thin wall condition or something but typically the counterbore can be bigger than you know it can grow more than the hole can right if the hole gets way too big you're not going to have any room for bearing surface for the bottom of the, the socket head cap screw or whatever you're using so the way we accomplish giving more tolerance to the counterbore is by identifying the hole with the same, you know, 14 thousandths that we would have gotten from a, a calculation of some kind. And then we can apply a separate position tolerance to the counterbore and make it much, much larger. Now, typically you use MMC on both of these, but you could use RFS on this one and MMC on this one because the counterbore really is usually just a clearance feature as long as it's not going to get too big and run into some other feature. Again, it'd be nice if this was the default for counterbores, but you know, people see this on a drawing and they kind of freak out and just assume it's going to cost more. Typically this would be the cheaper way to go. When you inspect it, Right, you can inspect them both the same way, right? You really should inspect the counterbore and the hole separately, right? Unless you have some gauge that can expand in both at the same time and capture both axes. And that's really not what you want either. They're really separate features called out with the same feature control frame. You could really think of this feature control frame as being repeated instead of it being, you know, a control that controls both of them at the same time. Now, this controls them separately. So at inspection, say you get a gauge pin, you know, you put it in here, you see if it's good, get a gauge pin, put it in here, see if it's good. You do the same thing down here, you just have more tolerance for the, the counterbore. Okay. And then the tolerance zones for this counterbore feature would look like so. Right? You have a small tolerance zone for the through hole, and you have a much larger tolerance zone for that counterbore feature. Now, there's another way to do this where instead of relating everything back to one feature control frame, we can actually relate the counterbore to the hole individually. So we're essentially going to treat every single hole, if there's you know, multiple, as a separate datum. You don't have to make each of them a datum and use every letter in the alphabet. It's just understood that you're going to do that by writing the term individually underneath the feature control frame. Let me show you what I mean. All 
All right. So in the example here, of course, this is an incomplete drawing, but I tried to put all the information we need. We've got a hockey puck shape with four counterbore, counterbore holes in it. Datum A is the flat on the back of this. Datum B is the outside diameter. We'll start on the front view. We've got four holes positioned to A and B, so they form a pattern. Now, they're counterbore holes, so we've got to take care of that counter bore. And I should make this arrow, it should go to the inside hole because that's what it's referring to. Now, in this uh, partial section view, we've got four times, so one for each of the counter bores. Whatever the diameter of the counter bore is, a position, but now we've got datum C is each of the counter bores, but they're gonna be repeated. So it's like datum C four different times for the purposes of inspection. It's not datum C is a pattern of four holes. It just gets repeated, and you know that because you'll put a note that'll say four times individually. So the advantage with this is the counter bore stays with the hole. So if you needed to give the position of the holes a large tolerance, you would be sure that the counter bores would follow them around. If you gave both the, say we did it the way we did a minute ago where you have a position uh, controlling the hole and the counter bore, if you make the position of both of them very large, you could get something like this where they're not coaxial at all. You could get the same thing when you apply two positions uh, separately to the hole and the counter bore. This keeps the counter bore with the hole. For inspection, it can be a little bit more difficult, but it's a tactic that you should be aware of. So this is the other way of doing counter bore holes. These are the three ways it shows you in the ASME Y14-5-2009 standard. So let's move on to patterns. There's a couple different patterns. Probably the most common you see out there is a rectangular pattern where you have like a, a square part and basic dimensions coming from planar datums. We also have round parts like this hockey puck that might have a polar coordinate system, so angles and a bolt hole circle, or a rectangular coordinate system on a hockey puck shape like this where we have features coming from the center, or uh, dimensions coming from the center lines. Let me draw a few examples of those and we'll talk about some of the differences. So let's dive into patterns. Patterns are very common on drawings where you have one diameter dimension for several holes that are all the same size. In other situations maybe have slots or other repeated features. It saves room in, the, in the, fa the, the face of the drawing. So let me give you a couple examples. All right, so a couple words about different kinds of patterns. Usually with position, the way you put the dimensions on there doesn't really matter that much. So let me give you an example. With this pattern, we've got four holes, a typical block with holes in it, good GD&T example. Datums A, B, C, four holes, position tolerance, they're all related back to the ABC datum reference frame. So every hole can be checked separately as long as it's in the same datum reference frame, the same setup that you would do. Depending on what you have around, you could do it with angle blocks and gauge pens and a height gauge, or you could do it with a CMM, all sorts of different things. But essentially, your tolerance zone stays fixed to the datum reference frame. Now, with the basic dimensions, you can actually uh, repeat them. So say we had an overall basic dimension here, we could just as easily come from this edge 
to here. And it would mean the exact same thing for inspection. As long as there's basic dimensions linking basic dimensions, you're good to go. It's just a matter of preference when you're drafting. Now, normally people are used to seeing it, you know, this dimension for this hole right here, but you don't have to do that. You could go all the way up here and then come back. It means the same thing because the basic dimension is the theoretically uh, exact location of the tolerance zone to the datum reference frame. So if you make a mistake and you, right, if you have three basic dimensions, right, with plus or minus dimensions, this would be overdefined. I wouldn't really recommend doing it with basic dimensions because people are going to not like it. But as far as inspection goes, it's theoretically perfect anyway. So there's no tolerance stack up here. Again, don't put this on a drawing because people will complain. But as far as inspection goes, it, it wouldn't make any possible uh, difference, right? Now, with this particular one, like I said, all the tolerance zones are two A, B, and C, the datum reference frame. You could have a composite position where you release that requirement. You could let tolerance zones, smaller ones, float within these larger tolerance zones uh, away from the datum reference frame, right? With a composite position, you're in the lower segment, you're not going to be measuring from uh, the theoretically exact location of the hole to the datum reference frame, you're only measuring this one right here, right, to the holes and maybe an orientation. Let's move to these. There's two basic ways to do uh, patterns of holes on a, like a bolt circle. The first is to do an angle and a bolt circle of both basic, right? In this case, your tolerance zone for position, and I didn't put the feature control frame, but just assume it's a position just like this, right? You're gonna get a round tolerance zone at the true position, right? I didn't put you know, any datums or anything, but the important thing, round tolerance zone. If you do it like this with coordinate basic dimensions, right? You're gonna get the exact same thing. Right, round tolerance zone at the true position. It makes no difference, right? As long as the math is correct, right? As long as you, you know, figure your angles and everything correctly and it's good in CAD, it doesn't make any difference for inspection. Whereas, if these are plus or minus dimensions, you're gonna get different shape tolerance zones. If this was 120 plus or minus a couple degrees and then two inches plus or minus something, you end up with a wedge-shaped tolerance zone. I actually have a, a General Motors uh, drafting manual from the 1950s where they basically said, don't do this, only do this. And most of the examples in that drafting manual are like that, right? So even way back then, they kind of recognized the wedge-shaped tolerance zone is not good. At least a square-shaped to tolerance zone is better than that. The other problem with this, with the angle, the further you get away from the center, you know, the further it can be off. For a simple part like this, it doesn't matter, but imagine you have a part with, you know, rings of holes. The further they get away from the center, you know, the more they can be uh, off in the, the angular direction. Okay. Let's move to something called bi-directional position tolerancing. When you put the diameter symbol in the feature control frame and apply it to a cylindrical feature, it indicates you have a cylindrical tolerance zone. It doesn't have to be though. You could have a square or a rectangular tolerance zone. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, there could be a situation where it's okay for a hole to be, you know, further uh, to the left or the right, but not up or down, and you could apply that tolerance that way. Say you have a, a slotted part fitting on top of a part with a hole in it, it might be okay for that hole to move in one direction a lot and uh, the other direction not so much. But let me show you what I mean. Okay, so I've got two uh, things going on here. We've got a bi-directional positional tolerance zone on a round hole. I don't know why in the world would you want to do this? Well, it gives you a rectangular tolerance zone. So the hole's going to have more tolerance in one direction than the other. 
Now, I wouldn't recommend using this unless there's like a clear need for it. Say you do a stack up and you, you need it for some reason, uh, but it, it is available and this is somewhat what it looks like in the ASME standard. Now, we've got a position of 30 thousandths in this direction and then a position of 60 thousandths in this direction. What that's gonna give us is a tolerance zone that looks like so. Whenever you do this for this example and the next example where I actually show it, you typically want to apply a perpendicularity to the feature, especially if it's a hole, because the axis could be tilted uh, 60 thousand, so it could be way out of whack when you're just trying to control. When you make the location that big, you also allow the orientation to get that big as well. So you might want to, and I can just go ahead and draw it up here. I want to apply a perpendicularity to that to make sure the hole stays straight, but it could go further this way and this way than it can this way, okay? Now, here's another larger example. This is with a, a circular pattern, right? So it's kind of like polar coordinates. We've got a basic dimension for this bolt circle. Since these holes are uh, on the center lines, we're going to assume it's 90 degrees basic. Right, so that's what controls the, the left and right, the dimension that controls it. Now, of course, as with all of these, they're uh, not fully complete. But we've got 20 thousandths that controls how far the hole is away from the center, so this direction. Then we've got 80 thousandths that controls basically the angle, how far it can be away in this direction. And then again, we've got this perpendicularity to control the orientation of each hole. Uh, one use for this that I can think of is say, this plate fits below a plate with slotted holes, right? So when you're uh, fitting a bolt through, it might not matter as much whether this is uh, intolerance in this direction, but it does matter in this direction, depending on how the slots are tolerance. Now, like I said in the beginning, this isn't stuff you necessarily need to use, but it is there. And uh, you know, if you want to get deeper into GD&T, this is good stuff to know, especially if you want to take the certification exam. This is the kind of stuff they like to throw on there. Now, let's move to the conical tolerance zone. So this has been in the ASME standard since at least the 1973 version. There must have been some company that's just desperately wanted it and some companies that still use it for something. I've never seen it on a drawing. If your company uses it, please let me know in the comments. I'd be super curious to know. It's meant for long holes where you have a position one position tolerance on one end of the hole and a smaller position tolerance on the other end of the hole. Let me show you how it's supposed to look on a drawing. So in the ASME standard, this is called closer control at one end of a feature. It really is only like a paragraph and I think only one figure. And uh, like I said, I've never seen it on a drawing. This isn't really supposed to be used for conical features. It's really for uh, cylindrical features that have a conical tolerance zone. If you're trying to uh, dimension a conical feature, I just use profile of a surface. Uh, so what we've got here is a, a long uh, tube with a hole in it got datum A is the outside diameter, datum B is right here, and what we're saying is whatever the position at surface H is, it's going to be 30 thousandths, and it grows to 90 thousandths at surface G. So if we drew that here, we'd start with 30 thousandths, Right. 30 thousandths at surface H, 90 thousandths at surface G, and the axis of the feature must lie within this conical tolerance zone. Okay, So it could be, you know, uh, it's got to be close on this side, but it can be further away on this side. Uh, as far as inspecting at the plate, I'm not sure. You'd have to find a really long gauge pen. I assume you just get your gauge pin in here as far as you can and check the position to A and B and then just do the same thing on the other side, okay? Next up is position tolerances without datum references. This can only be used in one situation as far as the ASME standard is concerned. 
It can only be used in one situation with coaxial cylinders. They can be the same diameter or a different diameter, but you're essentially slapping a position on there to establish a relationship between the two cylinders, so two or more, it can, doesn't have to be two. Let me show you what I mean on the board. So let's start, I'm going to give you a couple examples here. This is the way I would not recommend to do it. We've got a barbell shape with a hole going through it, a position on that hole to the two outside diameters. Now the simplest thing we can do is say two times those diameters make that datum A. The problem with this is that rule number one doesn't, can have, there's no relationship between uh, individual, between relate. And rule number one, there's no relationship between features. It's only individual features have to be perfect. So if this cylinder is, you know, not coaxial by one thousandths, is that good or is it not good? If it's not coaxial by fifty thousandths, is that good or not good? This doesn't help us solve that problem. So we definitely don't want to do that. What we could do is use our continuous feature symbol, that would establish a relationship between those features. It's essentially saying treat these two diameters like there's no gap in between them. So treat it like one feature, easy enough to simulate that. Now, usually this is gonna be good enough. But say this part, its only job is to slide into another part and you don't really care how much wiggle there is in the parts, right? So this slides into a hole and you don't care if there's any excess wiggle. Well, this is going to limit you just a little bit compared to if you use this concept called you know, position tolerance without datum references, now we're relating these two diameters with a position tolerance with no datum reference. So we're essentially saying they're related, but now we can get a material condition involved. So now we could say it's got to be within whatever at MMC, but you're going to get bonus tolerance if these two cylinders come in small and it's still going to fit through whatever you want it to fit through. So if you can accept these two cylinders becoming smaller, this might be the way to go. Now, you could also apply you know, total run out to these, but then it's kind of the same thing as a, a really tight size tolerance. You're not getting the benefit of an MMC call out. If the diameters are a different size, say this one is larger than this one, you would write two coaxial features underneath it. And for a lot of the things I've talked about in this video, you know, don't take what I said and put it on a drawing. You want to go, you want to look this up in the ASME standard because some of these things are people, things people don't see all the time. So you want to make sure you're sticking pretty close to the ASME standard. If your company uses this a lot, then by all means, go for it. But if you're putting it on a drawing for the first time, I would definitely look at the figures and try not to stray too far away. For example, you know, this is what it says in the ASME standard, two coaxial features. I wouldn't mess around and write, you know, two coaxial cylinders, right? Because whoever sees this has probably seen it for the first time. You know, I open the ASME standard and it's not going to be the same thing. So you could in, uh, introduce, you know, uh, room for error in that way. Okay. So the last thing we have to talk about in this video is a repetitive pattern, repeated datum reference frame. So this is a common thing in something like an instrument panel. So say you've got, you know, not for a modern car, but like an old timey race car, you're putting a speedometer in, you've got the, the bezel and then you usually have two studs or something that's going to fit through two holes. Well, that pattern, that feature is going to be related to the center bezel and the outside, but not any other instruments on the panel. And we can reflect this with GD&T. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, so this is a repetitive 
pattern, like I mentioned before, say it's a, a dashboard for a bunch of speedometers or tachometers or whatever instruments. It doesn't have to be a car, it could be a factory setting, right? So we got a hole for the center of the instrument and then the instrument will come with two studs that have to fit through two holes and we'll put bolts on the back. So it's important that these are relatively in the right place, right? We don't want them off by like inches or anything. But it's more important that these two holes orbit this hole in the middle. That's what we're really looking for. Say if this big hole is off by like, you know, quarter inch, is it really a big deal? Are people going to notice? We're just spacing instruments out, okay? So what we're looking to do is control these two holes to this big hole very tightly, but to allow each of these little planetary systems to kind of float around a good bit for ease of manufacturing. If you think of somebody making this, right, maybe they're only making one and they're at a, a, a punch press and they're just doing each pattern one at a time. They're going bang, hitting one, then the other, then the other. It doesn't really matter how they make it, but it's probably easier to make these three in line than it is to make all of these, you know, perfect. All right, so how we're going to accomplish this, I omitted the basic dimensions, but they would come from the datums as, you know, they should. Here's a detail view. We're going to identify these four big holes as positioned to A, B, and C, and we're going to make that datum D. Now this can be a pretty loose tolerance, right? We're just controlling where the big holes are. As far as the location, right, they can be pretty far off and our instrument is still gonna fit through there. But we couldn't apply that big tolerance to these little holes because if they're off, right, these studs won't fit through at the same time as the, the instrument itself and uh, the other stud, okay? So how we accomplished that we're going to do eight times all these little holes. This first feature control frame, this is a two single segment position. It basically, it could be written as two separate feature control frames. This isn't composite. We're just applying position twice. The first one is going to control all of the little holes to A, B, and C. Now this one could be somewhat loose. The second one is going to control the holes basically orbiting the big hole, right? Oh, the datums are only A and D. There's no rotation involved because we're not relating either B or C, right? So we're really just controlling the distance. The little hole can be from the big hole, but not any kind of rotation. That's what this larger tolerance is going to control. So, it's a little tricky, right? This can be pretty big, but the second one is always going to control the distance from here to here, which is what we want for the part to function correctly. Okay, So datum A is the big flat surface. Datum D is this hole right here. That is a repetitive pattern with a repeated datum reference frame. Now. This isn't the only way to write it. I could, I ran out of room, but in the actual detail view, I could say four times detail A. And then I would write two times these two holes, and then one time this big hole, and then it's understood that the whole detail is repeated. I think the ASME standard in 2009 kind of messes this up in the, uh, uh, the individual uh, section where it's talking about datums individually, it, it shows it as, say it's got this, it shows this and then shows the detail view as also being four times. But when you repeat a detail view, you're repeating all of the, the features within it. I hope you enjoyed it and you know learned something new about GDNT if you've already been using it for a while. And if you haven't, it's good stuff to have in your back pocket, especially if you ever want to take the certification exam. If you like the video, please like and subscribe. Leave a comment down below.